and the Wednesday night we're going to have a business meeting, and we'll go ahead and have it in here so we spread out just a little bit more uh, in that regard at uh, 6.30. So we're going to have Wednesday's words at 6.30 this week, and uh, we'll, we'll just see how that works. Nancy, raise your hand. Let everybody know you're here. Hello. So they can write a piece of paper, you know, I'm coming and you can airmail it to her here. Just throw it at her. But she'll, she'll pick them up so there's no trash. Okay? I will judge the, how the airplanes are That's back. it. <laughs> we did that in fifth grade in a science class. We built airplanes, paper airplanes were outside, let them fly. And I just built a big, you know, giant one. It didn't make it fancy or anything. And that thing took off and it was great. And it would have been the longest. But it, it hit the side of the building about 15 feet up and it'll just down there. Because it's almost there. For the longest one, it's going, oh, here he is. Because it was, you know, 15 feet off the ground. And then it hit the side of the building and dropped. So, uh, paper airplane storage. Anyway, wedding, Saturday, if you're coming, please let her know so they can get the right amount of, of food and everything, too. And if you don't, just come anyway. It's all if you, if you just say, hey, I'm not doing anything, I'll just do it. Right. And if, you need, the and if you need directions, I've got some, and we'll make sure that I, I bet uh, your GPS will get you there, too, if you use one of those. So we'll work, we'll I, I will warn you, if you park in the field up top, it's quite a ways down the wall, but if you come go down, it's sort of like a not a, it's supposed to be a gravel road, but I wouldn't really call it a gravel road, so it's a little bumpy. Y'all, just be aware of that right your OB and be careful. And yeah, we're looking forward to pray for, uh, looks like it's supposed to be hot this next weekend, but they, you don't want to rain for it. It's, all that. We, we're excited for them uh, as they start new life together as we get together for them. So uh, be in prayer for uh, one another. Uh, so you know, uh, my twin brother is back in the hospital last week. Uh, he goes to the hospital Sunday and he doesn't text me until Wednesday. Oh, I'm in mean the hospital. How can I pray for you, buddy? If you're, if I don't know. I may go home tomorrow. Well, he went home Friday and said he's doing okay. Those kind of things are just going to you know, happen with him. But he lives with my mom and he helps her out. She'll be 90 in November, so uh, that time when he has to go or if something happens like that, then uh, we have to scramble a little bit to make sure that uh, she's got everything that she needs. Remember them in prayer, appreciate it. And there are others, I know you have folks in your own life who need prayer. They need prayer. And I, folks, I, I think more than anything else right now in, 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 our, uh, in our world, in our nation, in our cities, in our own lives, in everything that's going on, God's people need prayer. And it needs to be uh, even uh, some of what uh, God can pray. We'll talk about that. We need to pray. We need to pray that, that uh, people will see God in us. We need to pray that hearts will be changed. We need to pray that we take care of and let people understand that it's all about sin and the sin in our hearts. And that the only person that can change us is Jesus Christ. And so we need to be praying about that. So join me in prayer as we continue in our service together. And uh, let's, uh, as we go, just think of these things that I've said, and uh, also as we go, uh, let God's Spirit talk to your own heart as you pray and lift up to Him. Uh, what's on your heart? Let's pray. Gracious Fathers, we come before you this morning. We want to praise your name. For your name is above all names. And there is something about the name of Jesus. Your word tells us that we are to pray in his name. Your word tells us what he's done on our behalf and the power that is ours for the Holy Spirit and that we can come to you. We don't have to be afraid to talk to you, to share with you, to, to tell you what we're feeling and what's going on in our lives. Yes, you already know that, but Father, you want us to be aware presence in our lives. And we do that. We 
also come before you to ask that you will forgive us for our sins. Father, where we may be proud, I pray that you will make us humble. I pray, Lord, when we think we are in control and we want to make or manipulate things, I pray that you will show us who really is in control. I pray, dear Father, that we will be great. and for your grace. And that in the midst of all that is going on, that we, Lord, we claim the peace that only you can give. Peace for our hearts. We pray for peace in our land as well. But Father, we know that cannot come unless we repent of our sins, we turn to you, we ask for forgiveness. they find themselves in. It might be, Father, a healing physically. It might be a healing mentally. Father, it might be just to give them an assurance that you're there for them in whatever way. We pray to you, Lord, that you will inspire us through your Holy Spirit to work and do what we can in your name so that you might have the glory. Let us not be afraid. Let us be bold. Let us be wise, as you've told us. And continue now, Holy Spirit, to move in our midst, to touch our hearts, to illuminate our minds and fathers of your word, that we might put the word of God in our hearts and lives and live it out. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Since we resume the meeting, uh, Brother Darrell has been preaching on Habakkuk. Last Sunday, he quoted uh, a passage from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. And that reminded Janie of a song that we used to sing at the tabernacle back in the 70s and 80s when James Bean was her song director. Janie can't remember where we ate lunch last Sunday, but she remembered that song <laughs> from 40 years ago and found it. The words are there on your handout, so let's sing, The Kingdom is Coming.
We're going to be looking at chapter 3 of the book of Habakkuk, so if you want to turn there uh, in uh, your Bibles, we'll read that in a moment, but I want to review a little bit where we have been. Uh, this third chapter of Habakkuk is a prayer. It really is, when we look at it, it's one of the great prayers of the Bible. It's on par with and placed alongside Abraham's intercession for Sodom or David's prayer, the dedication of the materials for the temple. And it's a prayer as much as any of the psalms that we find in our own lives that, that bring us uh, maybe some satisfaction or speak of how we feel. But it's a prayer, though, in a context which we must understand and, and, and only then can we properly put it in its place and understand what Habakkuk is saying to us. And so we need the entire book to, to understand the prayer. As you know, and as we've looked at, Habakkuk began his book by asking God why he was so slow in answering his prayer for revival in Israel. And I dare say that many of us can say that, say that same kind of thing. We've been praying for God to send a revival in our land. We might be able to say, just like Habakkuk, what is taking you so long, God? Please send a revival. And then God answers Habakkuk. But it wasn't the answer that Habakkuk was looking for because he said, I'm going to send the Babylonians to punish his people, Israel. And so when he heard that, uh, Habakkuk said, but God, how can you do such a thing? How can you use wicked people to punish those who are more righteous than themselves? Now these questions were asked in chapter 1 and God's answer came back in chapter 2. And as we saw in the last couple of weeks summarized in verse 4, it says, See, he is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. In the remainder of chapter 2, God described how the one who's puffed up, the Babylonians, would be punished. In the meantime, the one who knows God will live by faith in God. Times may be bad, the future may become worse, but the righteous will live by faith in Him who alone is worthy of that faith. So we come to the end of chapter 2 and verse 20 of that verse. It says this, The Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before Him. And it's an appropriate and solemn ending as God has answered Habakkuk. And really all that remains is for Habakkuk to worship this God and to lay his petitions before him. And so we come to chapter 3. Let me read this as we go through it. Understand this is a prayer and it is poetry. And so when we read it, we might sometimes go, huh? Because it doesn't maybe fit the way we would do poetry, and yet let me say that what he is doing is he's looking back at the things that God has done. And he's praying to God about who God is and what he's done for the nation of Israel. And he says, right it as we go, he says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigion. We don't know what that word means. We don't know if it's it was a particular day. We don't know if it is a particular tempo. It's there. God knows what it's there for. Or back and do what it's there for. But here we go. Oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. Oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. Now that word probably means there's a pause for you to think. By the way, these mountain ranges that he's speaking of are down towards the southern end of Israel, towards the uh, Sinai. And so when God came from them, see, he came to Egypt to his people. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. 
and the everlasting mountains were scattered, the perpetual hills bowed, his ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in an affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? That you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. So, uh, you divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went. At the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointing. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundation to death. So uh, you thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heat of great waters. When I heard my body tremble, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness in of my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. And he writes it to the chief musician with my string and chickens. And so ends the back of his prayer. Many of you recognize the name Anne Graham Watts. She's the daughter of Billy and Ruth Graham, and she's a well-known author and speaker. But if you ever listen to her, she also is a keen observer of contemporary events. Now, what I'm going to say, if she said, it happened about six years ago, but I think what she said is as relevant today as it was when she said it. She called on American Christians in 2014 to spend seven days in fervent prayer for our nation, and this is what she wrote about that call to prayer. She said, one of the things that he, that is God, has impressed on me is that we are living at the end of human history as we know it. In light of this, he's given me some practical assignments. One was to be the honorary chair for the National Day of Prayer in 2014. He gave me the message I was to deliver, which was from Joel 1. The day of the Lord is at hand. It was a message warning that judgment is coming. And she added these words. Please be assured there's no other agenda in this initiative. This is not about promoting anything or anyone. This is all about calling God's people together to pray before it's too late. And judgment falls on our nation. I don't know what God is doing with what has happened our world today. I told you I am not a prophet. But I know that God has allowed to happen in our world this pandemic. He has also allowed for us to see the injustices that we see among people. We've also seen disagreement in peace as well. What I can say, and this is true really since the beginning of time, that evil is running rampant in our world. And folks, we need to understand that God's children, we are to be set apart from the world. We are not to behave as the world behaves. We are not to get our clues from the world, although we need to listen to what is happening in the world, but we get our message 
from God in the scripture. When we come to our own country, and uh, it's interesting, I, I read uh, posts on Facebook that come, and most of those who I read are conservative like me. I mean, they're my friends, and a lot of them I grew up with, you know, in, in Orange County, California, which was one of the most conservative um, counties in the state for a long, long time. But you know, the United States of America is not so united. And we are divided, and in many places, people have risen up against each other. Christians are rising up against other Christians, and they have differing views about what is going on. And that happens. But people are being demonized. And Satan is having a ball watching what's going on. You know it, and I know it, what we have is a sin problem. And you know it, and I know it, that things cannot change unless hearts change. And that's our own hearts too, folks. We need to look at our own hearts and see that as we're living, if we're living for God and living as Christ followers, are we following what the Bible tells us to do? Or do we continue potentially to live in a culture in which we may have been brought up. Folks, I wasn't brought up in the South. Lived here a while. And the same kind of thoughts and things was not the same where I grew up. Let's put it that way. That doesn't mean that I don't need to listen. It doesn't mean that I don't even need to look at my own culture. If I look at my own upbringing, especially with, with my mom, and the, there, there wasn't a lot of racism in the sense of difference in color of skin for anybody. But if you were a Catholic, my mom had something to say. Then I went to school with some very good Christians who were Catholic. So you see, sometimes where we grow up, that culture comes in, and it may even be against what the Bible says. We have to monitor, we have to look, we have to understand. But we know this, that the only one who can change hearts is the Almighty God from Jesus Christ himself. And everything that we do, Christians, we need to do so that Jesus Christ is glorified. Not ourselves, not a position, not a statement, but that Jesus Christ is glorified in what we say and what we do. We need the Holy Spirit to fall on us. And we do need revival. As A. M. Graham Watt said before, it's too late. So I really do believe that she said those words in 2014, folks. I think that some judgment is coming and has come. As I said, I don't know what God intends, but I definitely can see him in this and what is going on. And there is a time when judgment comes. And we use phrases like uh, when the chickens come home to roost. The skeletons come out of the closet when it's time to pay the piper. What we're saying is that judgment is coming or has come. And sooner or later we all face the consequences of the choices that we've made. And this is true for nations. This is true for individuals. This is true for churches and denominations. The decisions that we make have consequences. You cannot mock God forever and you cannot ignore him or pretend that he isn't there, and you cannot do as you please without inviting judgment from him. And there's a time when judgment will come. And interestingly enough, this is what Habakkuk is about. God has told him, told him very clearly, Habakkuk, you pray for a revival, and this is what I'm telling you, judgment is coming. 
And at last, he understands the message that has come from God. And when he comes here to Habakkuk 3, we turn a corner in our study. And the whole tone of the book changes from the previous two chapters. We, we move from confusion to clarity and from fear to faith. And, how did, and that's what happened with Habakkuk. From confusion to clarity, from fear to faith. And here's the thing. Nothing has changed in the outside world. For Habakkuk. But Habakkuk has changed on the inside. There were a lot of bad, there was a lot of bad news in Habakkuk 1 and 2, but Habakkuk 3 is full of good news. It ends, as the book does, with a note of hope and praise. And we should ask ourselves, how did he get there? How did he move from his initial worry and fear to a place of confidence and joy and praise? How did he get to a place really, I would say, of peace in the midst of all that was going around him? Because you see, and I think that this doesn't sound familiar if I was describing our time, but for Habakkuk, the people were still mocking God. Violence was still in the streets. The Babylonians are still coming to Jerusalem. I don't know who our Babylonians are, but folks, we have things coming. And outwardly, everything is just as messed up as it was in the beginning. Nothing has changed, but for Habakkuk, he has changed from the inside. And chapter 3 shows how that's done. The outline to Habakkuk is very simple. The Habakkuk 3 it contains three things. It contains a prayer, it contains a vision, and it contains a testimony. We're going to look at those one by one and see what we can learn from the prophet's spiritual journey from confusion to clarity, from fear to faith. And as he starts his prayer, he says in verse 2, O Lord, I have heard your speech. That is what God just said and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. In face of impending calamity, the prophet prays for a full manifestation of God's power and mercy in the midst of judgment. It's as if he's saying, Lord, I know bad times are coming. I accept that. I'm not fighting against your plan. But, oh, Lord, if hard times must come, don't let the Babylonians wipe us out. Remember mercy. And we will perish. It's a perfectly biblical prayer. It's, it's honest. It's desperate. It's a man coming before his God in humility, putting his focus on the Holy One rather than on himself or those around him, but putting his focus on God, the Holy One, the Lord who is in his temple. And it is the kind of prayer that God will answer. Notice that he asked God, to do it again, and to do it in our day, do it in our time, do it in our midst. And this really ought to be a prayer of every thoughtful Christian at this point in history. God, whatever is coming, let us focus on you. And Lord, in the midst of it, we know that things are going to be happy that may not be exactly what we want, but we know that you have everything under control. We place our lives in your hands and we give ourselves to you and in that we find peace. And we need to say, and I think I've said it, I know in my own prayers, and I'm sure you have too, this is, I just ask God, show me where you are. Show me who you are. God, let us see, may the world see your power in the midst of what is going on. God may also need to show us our own sins. We also need to humble us and help us to pray and to seek his face. I guess it would be good to even personalize 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I've seen that up all over our church signs and stuff. We may have to. But what if we pray something like this? God is speaking. If you, 
my child who belongs to me, who is a Christ follower, if you will humble yourself and pray, if you will seek my face, if you will turn from your wickedness, turn from your sins, then, God says, I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. I don't think it's wrong for us to pray for a revival. And I think that Habakkuk is still trying to pray for a revival in his midst, in the people. And even those who will be taken to Babylon in captivity, there was within that community a remembering of what happened and how it was before, but also what they had done before God and committing their sin of idolatry, going after other gods, and forgetting their God, the only true God. And we see that it made a difference when they came back to reestablish and rebuild Jerusalem in the temple. You know, some people might think that we are on the brink of a great revival, and I hope that that is true. But we have to look at the timing. When I mean, you read, and when I've read about some of the great revivals in our past, the first great awakening, the second great awakening, the Layman's Prayer Revival, the 1904 Welsh Revival that spread around the world, the things that took place and happened because of that, the world was in difficult situations when things came, but people were living, when you hear people who lived in the midst of prior to and then through those revivals, as I saw them, people just lived for themselves, and there was a lot of sin going on in the world. And then God raised up particular people and men to preach the Word of God. And His Spirit moved in such a way that people saw their own sinfulness before a holy God and hearts were changed and nations were revived. Generally, you know, you don't receive a miracle until you desperately need one. And often it seems that God will not move in power until things have fallen into dire straits. Now, revivals are a work of God's hand and God's timing and in His sovereignty they happen, but we can pray for that. But don't just pray for a revival, pray for being revived yourself. Pray that God will work in you and that in you people will see difference. In you they will see what is going on with you. And I probably one of the best things to say, I just fall back in love with God. And He's shown me who He is. And I fear him because of his holiness. But he loves me. And I love him. I guess the greatest challenge to that really is the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, isn't it? We need to seek God's face. We need to join him in his work. We need to see where he is working. One of the beautiful things about experiencing God, and like we said in that, was that very thing. When we come to a point in our lives where there is, if you will, disturbance in our faith, we have to choose what are we going to do. And if you really want to do what God has called you to do, then you need to look at where God is at work and then join Him in that work. Because He is doing something and He calls us to, to be involved in what He is doing. And for each of us, He has gifted us. And in those gifts that he's given us, he's given us opportunities still, no matter what age, he's given us opportunities to be involved in his work wherever we might find ourselves. And he says, join me in that work. The second part that we understand from this, uh, this chapter is a, a vision. A vision. After his prayer, Habakkuk has a vision of God. It's what we might call a theophany, and that's just a fancy word that means that God appeared on the earth. We don't know how God spoke to Habakkuk, but it seems that it's some sort of vision that he had. That God revealed himself to him in verses 3 to 15. And these are, as I said, very poetic verses, and it is part of what Habakkuk is saying to God. 
The vision is God's answer to Habakkuk's cry, Lord, do something. And God says, Habakkuk, I think you've forgotten who I am. You're talking as if I can't hear you, as if I don't have any power. Let me show you who I am because of you. Understand, I am the one that will accomplish what I want to accomplish. And you can have peace in me and sleep at night because of who I am. The back of recounts God's activity in the past. And I bet you're a lot like me. When you look forward to the future, you don't know what God is coming. But you can look back into the past and see how God has taken you from one place to another place, from one maybe misery to another misery, and on and on and on. And you look back and say, I see God's hand here. I see God's hand here. I see God's hand here. I don't see God further. I, can't. I don't know what's coming, but I can look back and see what he's done for me in the past, and I'm assured that what he's going to do for me in the future, he's got to take it care of. Folks, even if we die, God's got it taken care of. So we don't have to fear death. And if God says we're going to live through it, we don't have to fear through what we're going through because God is going to take care of it. Maybe not exactly like we wanted or planned, but the way God wants it because he's working together everything for our own good, what is best for us, for those who are his and called according to his purpose. And so, back in records about what God is doing, he especially focuses on the Exodus, he focuses on the time in the wilderness. This is talking about crossing the Red Sea. It's talking about crossing the Jordan. It's talking about uh, Joshua's fight and the, the sun standing still and, and, and not moving until such time as it needs to. And God doing all that. And God is recounting all this and says, have you forgotten what I've done for you in the past? And folks, one of the things about Judaism, one of the things they continually do is they look back at what God's done for them. And what we need to do, as I've said, is to look back and see that we do have a big God. We have a God who does intervene, and He can intervene any time He wants to. Just, for instance, look at verses 13 to 15. I'm going to read it in the NIV translation. But it says, You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, he pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great water. When you look at those verbs, it says you came out, you crushed, you stripped, you pierced, you trampled. You did all these things, God, for us. And in that, we have to look at song and see the defeat of, utter defeat of those who oppose God. And folks, we know that that is going to happen eventually. God is one battle, the war, the end, it's done, it's finished, and he accomplished for us against the, the, the kingdom of Satan and against that sin that was in our lives, he accomplished it on the tree, which is the cross, and he said, it is finished. I don't have to do this anymore, and I love it in what it says in Hebrews, it says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, did what? Died on the cross. Those things come right together for the joy set before him. He died on the cross for us. We don't have to worry. We do go need to believe that Christianity is a fact. We have to believe that I love what James Montgomery Boyce said about this. Let me quote him. It says, The first issue any inquirer needs to settle is whether it, that is Christianity, is truly fact or only fiction. 
Is the biblical faith only a collection of beautiful and inspiring stories? Or did God actually deliver the Jewish people from Egypt by miracles at the time of the Exodus? Did he actually bring plagues upon Egypt? Did he divide the waters of the Red Sea and later the waters of the Jordan? Did he stop the sun and moon in the days of Joshua and Gideon? Above all, did he really send his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of his people, his death for their death, and then triumphantly rise again from the dead? If these things are true, we have a great God and in whom we indeed can rejoice. And we can rejoice if even the worst, that are even in the worst of times, as Habakkuk did, in quote. We have a big God, folks. And he shows us that all the time if we will only look. The problem, I think, for many is that their God is so small. Their God is their, of their own making. They don't believe in a big God that can do these things. Well, we come to the end, and the last part here is a testimony. A testimony of, of uh, the back. It starts in verse 16. He says, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation in Venice. There's acceptance of God's plan. Habakkuk is saying something like this. I, I get it, Lord. The Babylonians will attack us and then you will judge them. And I will wait for that day to come. In all likelihood, Habakkuk was not alive when the Babylonian Empire fell. Because it was at least 70 years after this. We don't know, maybe he did. We have no record of it. But he says, it's going to come. God has said it. I believe it. It will happen. And what he's really saying is, message received, I, I get it, Lord. So there's acceptance in his testimony, and then there's commitment in his testimony. Verses 17 and 18 probably sound familiar to you in some ways, but listen to what he says. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The word rejoice means to jump for joy, or even to dance for joy. Do you understand what Habakkuk is describing here? It is complete and total economic breakdown. In ancient Israel, it was an agricultural society, so if you run out of figs and olives and grapes and grain and sheep and cattle and all that, then you're in trouble. It's not really a random list. And I think we could, we could put some other things in there. What if the stock market went to zero tomorrow? How would your 401 case be? How would your investments be? you face that when it all seems to go away? But what if your children end up in jail and you lose your job? What if you run out of food and you can't pay your bills? What if your loved ones never come to Christ? Or what if the doctor says it's terminal? What if your spouse has a heart attack and you're left alone? What if you lose your job because you're a Christian? What if you end up jail because, in jail because of your faith? Many of you have heard the name K. Warren, Greg Warren, K. Warren. K's his wife. I met Greg before he came back. Uh, no big deal. I'm not saying anything. He just happened to go to school where my youth minister went to school and he did a retreat for us when I was in uh, high school. The other thing was his, his in laws were members of my church in Orange for a little while. So uh, I met Greg and I met K a couple times when. He, she came to visit her mother and father. But not too long ago, they were uh, they were put in the spotlight uh, in a very sad way when their 27-year-old son, Matthew, committed suicide. And, uh, he had been struggling for years with mental illness. And uh, a couple years later, on the day that would have been his 29th birthday, his, his mom, Kay, made some reflections. And I want to pretty much finish some of what she had to say because I it does say something to us. 
July 18, 1985, I gave birth to our beloved gift of God, Matthew David Ward. Holding him in my arms that morning, I had no idea how dark the journey would get for him and for those who love him. All I knew that bright morning was that I was madly in love with him. We could see nothing ahead but a mother's dream of a good life for her son. So I remember Easter 1985. I was sick in bed, unable to go to church. Rick took the kids to church and I stayed by myself for a few hours. The TV remote by my side is my only companion. So somehow I dropped that remote and I couldn't get it. Couldn't reach for it. I couldn't even on one of the most joyous holidays see a TV preacher to keep me comfortable. So I painfully reached for my Bible and fell open to Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19, those verses that I just read. This is a word from the Lord to me, and I determined that even if my worst nightmares came true, if my baby died or I never walked again, that I would trust in God my Savior and would rejoice in the sovereign Lord. And then he was born, and everything seemed fine, but by his first birthday, we began to wonder, and by his second and third birthdays, we knew he wasn't like his older sister and brother. When he took his life after battling and fighting so hard for decades, a friend sent me Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19 in a sympathy card. She had no idea this passage was incredibly significant to me, that it was a fitting bookend for his life. It became uh, his greatest pursuit in my deepest anguish. So I had come to the point in which I said, as I had 20 years before, even if my worst nightmare comes true, and he takes his life, I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And so on his 29th birthday, what would have been that, she says, through weeping, I shouted to the watching universe, I will rejoice. The Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior. My heart remains wounded and battered, but my faith is steady. There is and will be, as Stephen Curtis Chapman says, a glorious unfolding of all that God has in store for me and my family. God is faithful to his promises of rebuilding and restoring the ruins, and I am confident that I will yet be a witness to many, many, many lives healed and hope restored, all because of my beloved gift from God, Matthew David Moore. When the dearest things are taken from us, and we say, as Habakkuk said, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will have joy in the God of my salvation. Because those things happen, don't they? There are things that happen in our lives. But we do have a great God, a wonderful God, a sovereign God. And our faith isn't about what we feel. It's not about our circumstances. Faith chooses to believe. And it says, as Habakkuk said, I will wait patiently and I will rejoice. Yesterday, in one of the devotions that I did sent to me, it's Psalm 27, 14. And when I read it, I go, oh, that's not so bad. <laughs> you know, sometimes God out of the blue just gives you some things, doesn't he? Psalm 27, 14 says this. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. The last verse of Habakkuk's prayer is one that sometimes gets overlooked. He said, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the high. I can remember on vacation going to uh, Glacier National Park and, and in other times being in the Rockies and seeing the mountain goats going and jumping in places that <laughs> how do they get there and how they get up and how do they get down and just watching them go. I remember driving one time in Utah and I think everybody else was asleep but I'm driving and I see this deer coming down a hill hopping down the hill. I'm driving, and it looks like we're going to meet. He just hops down the hill. Luckily, as I got to him, he didn't come across the road. I'm going to 
it also was kind of neat to watch what, how that animal behaved, what they did. In all that God does for us and in us, if we will let him, he will make our feet sure. You never read the book Hind's Feet on High Places by Hannah or Art. It's written in 1955. But it is it's an allegory. But it talks about how a believer in Christ goes through things to be able eventually to jump in the high places of the mountains with sure firmness. And Habakkuk ends his journey with those that verse. He enables me to tread on the heights. Nothing has changed on the outside. People of Judah have still forgotten God. Violence still reigns in Jerusalem. The wicked still oppress the righteous. The Babylonians are God's appointed instrument for judgment. But a backup has changed on the inside. I hope that you never feel like giving up or quitting on God. But I do know and have met people that things have happened in their lives and they have a hard time believing that God is for them. They have a hard time believing that God is even there. They wonder. I think we need to understand that it's always too soon to give up or to quit for the believer. This series is called Strong Faith for Confusing Times. We are in confusing something that we need to know. Read it back and think about it, what it has to say to you. And one final thought to leave with you. You'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And when Jesus is all you have, then and only then will you discover that Jesus is all you need. Let's pray for you. Father, when we started this, we weren't really sure where it would lead. We didn't know what was going to be happening in our world, and you did. Father, you give us the appropriate things at the right time, and we will just look and listen. Lord, I pray that each one here knows you and has a faith in you. I pray that their faith will not be rocked when things come into their lives, but they have an assurance even if they can't see it, they have an assurance in you. It's not a feeling. It's a confidence. Because we believe in your word. And we believe that you, as the word of God, came. You came in grace. You came in truth. You came to... Show us the kingdom of God. You came so that we might be part of that kingdom. You came to show us that sin has separated us from you. That only through Jesus Christ can we come to the Father. Father, I pray for each one of us that we will examine our own hearts. To see, Lord, if there is any sin in there that needs to be confessed in our lives. Things that we need to say to you. I repent, I turn, I'm sorry. And then accept the forgiveness that is ours for your grace. Not for anything that we do. Because of Jesus and what he has done. Grant us, Father, to look to you. And we turn our eyes to you. And be confident in our faith. You are the perfecter and the finisher of that faith. Praise be to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Go in peace. Have a great day. Oh, no, I forgot to say this. If you're thinking about going on the trip in September to Gatlinburg, please see Brother David back here. Over here. Go see him. Say, I'm, I'm interested. Tell him what I need to know. God bless you all.